thank you very much, Professor, for the introduction, and it's a pleasure for me to uh, be part of this uh, program, which I think that has been very successful and has touched upon very important topics and with very lovely uh, discussions. So the last talk that I will give is uh, multimodality imaging for diagnosis of aortic stenosis and patient selection for TAVI. These are my disclosures. And um, basically, I will try to concentrate on uh, TAVI patients, and I will not go only for preprocedural imaging and patient selection. I will also touch upon periprocedural imaging and the follow-up, which I think that is uh, very important as well. So in terms of aortic stenosis assessment, uh, the severity, we all rely on echocardiography, and we uh, know perfectly which are the um, parameters that we uh, take into, into account to define severe aortic stenosis, a jet peak velocity of more than four, a mean gradient of more than 40, an aortic velferia less than one square centimeter, an index less than 0 0.6. And we have uh, patients like fulfilling all these criteria where the diagnosis of severe aortic stenosis is very easy to make, but we can have also patients with aortic stenosis that they have discordant grading. And most of them are, for example, patients that have a poor left ventricular systolic function. We have here the aortic valve, which looks calcified and open it very much. And we have no regurgitation, and we have here the peak velocity that is 2.5. But if we calculate the aortic valve area, the aortic valve area is less than one. So the question that we have in these patients is, is this a true severe aortic stenosis, or is this a pseudo severe aortic stenosis and the aortic valve doesn't open because the left ventricular function is very poor and it cannot generate uh, enough stroke volume? So there are two ways of trying to discern this question. Either we increase the flow reserve, and we see if the aortic valve remains tight, and that will be a severe aortic stenosis. And if it opens more, then the problem is the left ventricle. And the other one is to assess the uh, calcium burden of the aortic valve. So in order to increase the flow, what, uh, one of the uh, techniques that we can use is the debutamine stress echocardiography. And here we have our patient. And we can see that at peak do doses of dobutamine, which is maximum 20 micrograms, the flow can increase, we increase the gradient, and the aortic valve area remains below one. In that case, we will say that is true severe aortic stenosis. As I said before, in this algorithm, if we increase the contractile reserve, and that makes, I don't see very well, yesterday there was a much better pointer. Do you have the pointer of yesterday? That was much better. Yeah, that is very nice. So if you increase the uh, contractile reserve and the flow, and the gradient increases, but also the aortic valve area increases above one square centimeter, that will be a pseudo-severe aortic stenosis. The problem is in the left ventricle. In principle, these patients are currently manage uh, conservatively with medical therapy. And then we have a subgroup of patients where we cannot increase the flow, we cannot increase the contractile reserve, and we still remain in doubt whether that patient has true severe aortic stenosis or not. In that case, I think that CT has helped us to uh, identify the patients that have severe aortic stenosis. And we know that the higher the burden of the aortic valve calcium on non-enhanced coronary um, computed tomography, the higher the probabilities of having a severe aortic stenosis. And this was shown by the group of uh, Philippe Ibarro, for example, in this uh, retrospective study of 646 patients with moderate and severe aortic stenosis, 27% of them with low gradient severe aortic stenosis. These are the different groups of patients for men and for women. And you have the ones that will be moderate aortic stenosis. These are the ones that have the lowest burden of aortic valve calcification. And then you have here the patients with a reduced um, 
aortic valve area below 0.6 and a mean gradient that is high, above 40, these are the ones that have the highest uh, aortic valve uh, calcium burden. Then the patients that have a reduced aortic valve area less than 0.6 and a mean gradient that is low, they have a much higher calcium burden than the ones that have moderate aortic stenosis. And this is the same for men and for women. However, the uh, cutoff value to define severe aortic stenosis based on the calcification of the aortic valve is different for men and women. It's much lower for women, which is, will be above a threshold of 1,200, while for men is above a threshold of more than 2,000. And among, among the patients with low gradient severe aortic stenosis, than, like the patient that we uh, showed, 45% of the women and 64% of the men had an aortic valve calcification burden above that pre-specified cutoff values, which means that this technique would help us to uh, differentiate those patients. The evidence on using computer tomography to identify the patients with true severe aortic stenosis has been increasing since that publication, and here, uh, the, this international multicenter observational registry, including almost 1,000 patients, they demonstrated the same results. They also showed similar cutoff values to define severe aortic stenosis for women and for men, so about 1,300 uh, for women and about 2,000 for men. And the most important thing, they also have pronostic implications. All this evidence has uh, made an important impact in the recommendations on how to assess the aortic valve stenosis. And for the first time, the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging uh, recommendations and the American Society of Echocardiography recommendations include the use of calcium score by CT to identify the patients with severe aortic stenosis. And therefore, our, uh, severe aortic stenosis is likely when the calcium burden of the aortic valve in men is at least 2,000 and above, and in women more than 12,000. Once we have decided that the patient has a severe aortic stenosis, and based on the heart in discussions, we think that that patient may benefit much more from TAVI than from surgical aortic valve replacement, we need to uh, decide two important aspects. One, which is the size of the prosthesis that we will implant, and second, which will be the approach that we will use in order to do the TAVI. For the aortic annulosizing, there are several methodologies. We can use angiography, we can use transthoracic, we can use transophageal echo. But these are two-dimensional imaging techniques, and we know by now that two-dimensional imaging techniques are not accurate to uh, define the annulus of the aortic valve and to select the prosthesis size and we should be using much more a three-dimensional imaging technique. Which one? Whatever you like and whatever is uh, more convenient to you. Either transesophageal echocardiography, three-dimensional, CT, which is the easiest and the most available probably, and CMR, which is a little bit more complicated sometimes, but depends on the facilities of each center. Which are the implications of an accurate aortic annulosizing? We need to minimize the risk of paravalvular leak, we need to minimize the risk of prosthesis migration if we select a very small prosthesis, and we need to minimize the risk of annular rupture if we select a very large uh, prosthesis. And for that, as I said, probably CT is the most frequently used imaging technique. Why? Because the data that we acquired with CT is um, complete full volume of the uh, ventricle and of the entire heart, and we have all the data we need there. We just need to align the multiplanar reformation planes, as you can see here in this figure, across the aortic annulus in order to see the cross-sectional uh, view of the aortic annulus. Let's see if this works. So here we do the cross-sectional planes, and then we get here the uh, cross-sectional area of the aortic annulus, and we can uh, scroll up and down in order to see the three valleys of the leaflets coming uh, symmetrically. That would be the way to do it, and that is very accurate. Now, is three-dimensional echocardiography also useful? 
Indeed, there are several advances. The image, in, in, image quality has improved, and there are softwares that can uh, analyze the aortic annulus uh, probably automatically with minimal uh, interaction by the observer. And we have shown that compared to CT, when we assess the area or we, we assess the perimeter of the aortic annulus, actually the bias between the echo and the CT is close to zero. But the limits of agreement are rather broad. What does it mean? That maybe in some patients it can make us doubt between two sizes of the prosthesis. And this uh, bias of agreement is broader when the patient has a lot of calcification in the aortic valve. And this is why, because if you acquire the 3D echo, like in this case, first one, which is the normal one, you see that the calcium that is in this area is making a shadow in the lower part. And I'm going to miss part of those uh, data. While if I think that is three-dimensional view, I can acquire the data in order to minimize the risk of the shadowing by the calcium, and that makes that I can have a much more accurate assessment of the aortic annulus. So three-dimensional echocardiography could be helpful, but you need to know how to acquire the data and think that because it's a three-dimensional imaging modality, you can optimize the way of acquiring the data in order to avoid the artifacts by the calcium. It's important to assess the aortic valve calcifications. So in this sense, it has been a lot of discussion. Some centers do not use it at all. Some centers, we use it, for example. Why? Because it has been associated with the risk of paravalvular leak and because it has been associated with risk of annular rupture and conduction disturbances. And the case that you are seeing here is a patient from our center that was uh, treated no so long ago and you can see that here, close to the uh, mitral aortic continuity, there is a very bulky calcification. The patient got uh, a balloon expandable valve, and what we saw, I don't know if you can see it now, better, yeah. So what you can see is that this calcification here, there is there an extra vasation here of the, uh, the contrast and this annular rupture. This was the calcification that was at baseline and this is how it was at follow-up. And on transophageal echo you can see here the annular rupture with this cavity that we had to uh, treat. In this case we treated with a valve in valve in order to seal the entrance and the result was good. Then the second question is uh, which is the access to do the TAVI. And with the development of the devices, it has been shown that transfemoral should be the way to go because it's associated with less complications, much easier, can make the procedure under conscious sedation, and is much more friendly for the patient. But sometimes we still need to go for transapical access, for example, when the femoral arteries are not appropriate, or transubclavian, or direct aortic. So it's very important to have a good assessment of the femoral arteries and for that we are going to use CT. It's the imaging technique that gives us the best evaluation of the femoral arteries in terms of diameters and in terms as well of uh, circumferential calcifications. Sometimes we can have dramatic cases like for example this case. This was done during the orthography and the angiography that we do before uh, the procedure. And you can see that here down in the aorta is there is something floating, but you cannot see it very well. On CT, you can see that there is a massive thrombus here that we can have problems with the passing of the uh, catheters. Unfortun uh, luckily for this patient, nothing happened, but it's important to know always. And then during the procedural imaging, the majority of us, we started uh, with transophageal echocardiography to assist the uh, procedure, but as I said, with the advancement or with the development of the delivery sheets and the devices which are much smaller profile, we have changed more to transthoracic echocardiography. 
issues to consider during the procedure. The most important, the hemodynamic result after the implantation, the potential complications like pericardial effusion, and the most frequent one would be the presence of paravalvular regurgitation. And in this case, I think that transophageal echocardiography is far superior to transthoracic echocardiography, because here you can see this patient, I can see very well where the paravalvular leak is. This one is much more like a guessing echo than anything else. But that is what the interventionalist want, and then we need to go out. But, for example, there can be cases like in this one, where the uh, interventionalist performs angiography, and then says that there is a paravalvular leak. But is this paravalvular is central? Is it caused by the wire or is it caused because there is no good apposition or no good sealing of the annulus? So I think that there the transophageal echo gives much more information. This is the same patient and you can see here that there are several par uh, leaks and all of them paravalvular, particularly in this one. I don't know if you can see it, if uh, the mouse follows the slide. Here in this one, you see that there is outside completely of the frame, and we may need to revaloon. And you can see that after the revalooning, there is a significant reduction of the paravalvular leak. So there, for that, I think that transophageal echocardiography is far superior to transthoracic echocardiography and fluoroscopy. And needless to say that, for example, when there is a central leak, like in this case, the entire half of the frame here in the center is filled by a regurgitation, and this is because one of the leaflets uh, has not been expanded, it's completely frozen. This, we are not going to differentiate it by a fluoroscopy. And there we need uh, the transophageal echocardiography because here revalooning is not going to help, it's going to even make it worse, and what we need is a valve in valve in order to solve that problem. And sometimes these patients with this uh, leak, they can get very uh, sick acutely. Then at follow-up, what we need to check? At follow-up after TAVI, we need to check paravalvular regurgitation, the risk of endocarditis, which is not very frequent, but that can happen, and the valve thrombosis. And for this, I will focus on the valve thrombosis, because in 2015, we were more or less all shocked by this uh, publication of uh, Raj Makar in New England, indicating that <clears throat> there were patients where there, there were sort of thickened leaflets of uh, the TAVI valves and they were not opening. So that was a little bit concerning and it went on and on in terms of more uh, research and indeed one of the largest series is this one, uh, published two years later with 752 patients where they show 13% of thrombosis. This is assessed with multi-slice CT because what you can see on echocardiography, most of the times, the gradients remain the same. They, you don't see any dysfunction. But in some cases, it has been associated with the risk of TIA of strokes. And some publications have shown that anticoagulation is effective, but there are publications as well, like one of uh, my colleague Lars Sondergaard, where they show that these um, abnormalities can uh, appear and disappear even without anticoagulation. Indeed, the Galileo 4D, that is a substudy of the Galileo trial that was comparing rivaroxaban plus aspirin versus clopidogrel versus aspirin after TAVI, it showed that the patients that were treated with rivaroxaban, they were showing much less frequently this phenomenon. There were no differences on echo as compared to the group that were treated with antiplatelet, but there were so very few event, events that the association of this finding with the risk of stroke or TIA was not seen. And the trial was stopped prematurely because the group that was treating with rivaroxaban were dying more, probably because the doses was quite high, 10 milligrams, and it was not treated maybe with a much lower doses like in the COMPASS trial that was 2.5. It's important to see that not always is thrombus, and I explain you this case of a 82-year-old uh, lady who received a TAVI, and she had very good result, no paravalvular leak in transthoracic echocardiography, and she developed atrial fibrillation afterwards. The patient started with rivaroxaban treatment, 
and the river oxabral treatment had to be stopped because the patient had bleeding of the colon and a colon carcinoma was diagnosed. At that moment, the echo showed an increase of the gradient and you can see that there is even mitral regurgitation and despite increasing again and in introducing again anticoagulation, this didn't disappear. We did a CT and there are restricted leaflets but not really thickened and eventually the patient went for surgery and what you see here is a sort of calcification of all the leaflets. So be careful, not always is a thrombus. And with this table, I summarize how to use multimodality imaging for the management of patients with TAVI, with the different imaging techniques, when to use it in the pre-procedure and what to check for, what to use during the uh, procedure and at follow-up. And I thank you very much for your attention.